there's a lot of loneliness in at different levels in what would what would that look like in terms of bringing fresh expressions at these two meaningful events for people to encounter Christ in a unique way that only your church can offer because you know the context and you know the people they are there and, and perhaps it's not that we're going to be able to erase the loneliness but maybe there will be this encounter with the holy word with holy Christ with the meaning of what it is to be an inherited church but embracing others who are not able or who have not put a foot at the door in the building Hello everyone welcome to the Pivot podcast where we explore how the church can faithfully navigate the changing world I'm Terry Elden and I'm joined today with my co-host here Dwight Chiley One of the key pivots that we talk a lot about on this podcast is the need to expand our imagination in the church for the forms of church or Christian community that are needed to reach people in today's world. One size or shape of church isn't enough. For the most part, traditional or inherited attractional churches are having a very hard time reaching people who aren't already Christian, especially if they focus on worship as the entry point. And that's why we are so excited to have as our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Alicio Mejia. He is a church planter, educator, author, and trainer who works with Fresh Expressions in North America as director of Expresiones Divinas and teaches at Asbury Seminary and United Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Mejia, welcome to the Pivot Podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's so good to see you both and to enjoy this time together and be able to be available for the listeners uh, as we uh, de- take a deep dive into, into this conversation. Well, let's start with having you tell us a little bit about your journey into ministry and how you landed where you are today. Well, my commitment to church planting and the development of new faith communities has marked my journey in ministry. Um, I can trace it back all the way to different settings, countries, and cultures. And lately, in the last probably 20 years, I was serving uh, as the assistant director of New Church Plant in Kentucky. And I had the privilege of developing, training, recruiting, and equipping church planters to oversee how, to, how, we, how are we going to do new faith communities. So my work has always been rooted in creating sacred spaces for what I call intercultural, multicultural, and multi-ethnic and cross-generational movements. And over the years, lately, probably the last six, seven years, I've been involved in contextualizing missional coaching moments for cause, post, I would say post-COVID realities that you and I, we, we face um, in the past. And, and as a coach and director of Expresiones Divinas for Expressions, our focus has been consistently on building authentic relationships and fostering environments where the Holy Spirit can lead us to new and existing congregations in those vibrant mission-focused communities that we want to reach. So tell us a little bit more about Expresiones Divinas or Fresh Expressions. Like, what are they for our listeners who, who might not know that term? And certainly in, in Espanol and Spanish, um, you know, h- how are these taking hold in the Spanish-speaking community? Sure. Uh, I think the Fresh Expressions or Expresiones Divinas, they're crucial because they provide an innovative ways to engage with people where they are those who may not be connected with what I call inherited church settings. In a sense, um, for expressions or expressions divinas offer that, what I call that flexibility and the con- how, how to contextualize relevant ways to, to bring faith, life, discipleship in, in locations and places where you probably would least suspect it, such as, you know, church at the lake, uh, church on motorcycles, church on, 
on bicycles or, or what some people may not even use the term churches. So let's say a faith community or a group of people who are really enjoying what God has given us as expression of our, our nature or creation. So we want to meet people where they are, speak the language in which the gospel makes more sense, and whether these expressions happen in coffee shops, parks, online spaces, what we want is to embody the mission of God in a way that is accessible and meaningful to a much larger audience so we can breathe and breathe bring and breathe new life into the church by embracing creatively how we do this reaching out. So I'm curious how these fresh expressions uh, play with are in the ecology of the inherited church structures. And I wonder if you can give us a story or an example of how you see those working together or playing alongside each other. Sure. Uh, for instance, there's River of Life uh, of Church here in, in Kentucky. Uh, they, they began what is called the table. That is the what we call the dinner church setting. And interestingly, though, uh, as I was praying in that particular city, I was praying that God will allow us to bring, begin fresh expressions without, without not knowing my neighbors on the other side of my house, they were trained in how to do uh, dinner church uh, because they were trained uh, down in Oregon. And so they, 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 they were praying for this specific uh, expression uh, of, of real of a life congregation. And so they began the table and my goodness gracious, in less than a year, they were running out of space, and now they are in another location, and they have begun in a new city the same initiative. Now, having said that the, the, the dinner church, that's not the only way of doing for expressions. There they, they are other things that I just mentioned before, like Churros and, chocolate, churros and Chocolates in Marion, Illinois. If you want me to expand on that, I will tell you what happened there. Go for it. Tell us. Churros y Chocolates uh, is, an, is a Mexican expression to say, uh, we want to connect with you where you are. And it is happening in Marion, Illinois. And my good colleague uh, is, is in charge of that, Reverend Rocio Williams. And she had this idea that in a sense, when, you know, when Hispanics or Latinos come to the USA, they long, there, there's this, this sense of longing in, in the memories of their country where they came from. So we want, we want to provide for them a place to belong, a place where they can find a new community. So Rocio came up with the idea of churros y chocolates because one day she said, I I'm feeling the same as everybody else in the community. And, and so, so she said, what would be the best way to do that? How, how could I, how could I do life together? How could, how can I create community? And so, she began with that idea in mind, and many people began to pop over to, you know, come into her house, and, and they, were, they were growing so fast that they suddenly they had to have a bigger space, and they went back to the church, and Churros and Chocolates became one of the ways that they were reaching into the community. And, and, and it gave people the opportunity to enjoy life, not probably recreating the past, but a place to, to really have fun and, and to listen to God's narrative um, and how those narratives are connected because by the time Churros y Chocolates began to meet new people in the community, then those relationships or those networks connected with many other spaces back home and in other locations in the USA. So I'm curious around that example of how this fresh expression emerged out of some longings of inherited cultural meaningful moments, right? Or cultural elements that provided meaning for their story or for, their, for a people, right? 
What I'm curious about, as you look across these fresh expressions, where are those longings or tapping into the spiritual inherited kinds of um, practices where meaning might be made? Because I think, for example, I'm an ELCA Lutheran. We like to have word and sacrament in a, in a, in a sanctuary, in a church building as the center. And I think our fresh expressions are not starting there. But somehow there's longing to how do we encounter Christ in the meal or in the sacrament of communion. And it kind of is, is a backward design. They back into something as opposed to having that be the front door. I wonder for your expressions, fresh expressions, how are they tapping into those inherited spiritual practices? You, uh, you just said it. You just name it precisely. Those two components are key and they will be part of the fresh expressions. We're not... Um, we're not creating, we're not reinventing something new. We can create a new sacred space where those elements take place and take meaning where people are. Now, the question to you would be, is the church open to do such an event that is so meaningful in the life of the church that would they be willing to do that outside of the walls? That would be a key question to answer because we don't, you don't, we don't want to alienate anybody in the process. And, but those are key components of what I would say a new fresh expressions of your congregation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and I like what you're highlighting. I think one of the assumptions that's happened in a lot of inherited churches, at least in the main line, is that they assume if you're sitting next to each other in the pew, you're cultivating Christian community or you're tapping into the spiritual longings if you go to a worship service. And what this is doing is saying, no, actually cultivating Christian community and tapping into our spiritual longings, it starts in a very different place and encourages different practices. Right. And if I, if I may add this, what I read as I travel across the USA, I sense that there is a, a problem that is everybody's facing, and, and I call it a deep sense of loneliness. There's a lot of loneliness in, at different levels, and what would, it, what would that look like in terms of bringing fresh expressions and, 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 and this two meaningful events for people to encounter Christ in a unique way that only your church can offer because you know the context and you know the people there are there. And, and perhaps it's not that we're going to be able to erase the loneliness, but maybe there will be this encounter with the Holy Word, with Holy Christ, with the meaning of what it is to be an inherited church but embracing others who are not able or who have not put a foot at the door in the building. So I'm curious just to go back to explore the example that you shared of children and chocolates a little bit more. So, okay, so what happens when they gather? Like, what do they do other than, the, I know there's children present and there's chocolate, but what else? Like, what does it look like? It's a big fiesta time. Everybody talks <laughs> loud and, and they greet one another. They either hug, they kiss. They just, just begin to foster community and celebrate. They celebrate culture, things, their heritage. They address Latino community issues, perhaps, specific needs and challenges that they're going through. Everybody is welcome and is open with open arms in that kind of environment. And let me add this, and it's very intergenerational, which is another component of the church growth movement nowadays. Very intergenerational because you have kids running, the youth interacting with the old, with the elderly, or helping grandma or grandpa, abuelito, abuelita, and they hang in together as a new faith community. Yes, that's wonderful. So, so if we think about the landscape of uh, the church in North America, and we think about the cultural diversity that's present, um, I want to just invite you to explore more with us how vital it is to have these kinds of culturally specific um, expressions of church that um, 
provide a, a sense of home, perhaps, for people who are, um, you know, immigrants or who are not in the dominant culture, and but then how they might relate to the broader landscape of churches, because you talked a lot about intercultural church and cross-cultural, you know, connections. And so just what are you seeing in terms of promise and possibility and also struggle around that? I think that some of the promises are the following. Number one, there's the, U, the USA as a country, we, I think we have about 400 and so many languages spoken in the USA. We have become the third largest missionary field globally. So culturally, there's this celebration opportunity to reach people where they are. For instance, um, my wife teaches at the Fayette County Public School System in Lexington, Kentucky. And what we have found that just in that district, there are about 79 different languages spoken. Independently, how you see the present immigration process that countries, not just in the USA, but countries across the globe are experiencing, then you, we need to begin to think, wow, there are millions of people with whom we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because at the end, the book of Acts chapter 17, I think it's verse 26, uh, speaks about the fact that, um, that God is the one bringing people to find him wherever they are. Now, having said that though, um, yes, this represents challenges because now we have to think that the gospel is not just spoken in English, that the gospel, the richness of it, the history of who we are in Christ, it, it comes from so many backgrounds and opportunities. And so how do we adjust to the cultural settings, the, the new environments that are coming in, not just even of uh, people moving in, but for instance, I'm coaching a pastor in Colombia, um, and, and he, he was telling me that there, there's going to be in the next five years, the, the investments of different organizations and companies it's going to be over $20 billion. And, and so you have now new families coming, engineers, different settings, different environments. And he was saying, so how do we do that? And the church is going to be at the very center of the growth of these many companies. So they will have to reimagine themselves. It's not just about reaching other cultures, other countries, other nations, but the challenge of how do we reimagine what would be like for this congregation to be relevant in the community that they're going to be building. And so I'm curious for some of our listeners uh, and, and viewers who may not be as familiar with some of the church planting going on in um, across Latin America, for instance, and particularly Protestant uh, church planting. Um, tell us a little bit about what that landscape looks like. Uh, thank you for, for, for that. Uh, and I would probably use two components over here, the Global South and the Global North. The Global North has resources, plenty of resources. But according to the growth and the multiplication of congregation, the Global South has surpassed immensely what the Global North has been leading us to this point. So I think that th this globalization or this international ministry influences uh, can bring to us, number one, a posture of cultural humility. The global north as, a, as such, we need to say, okay, what is it that they are doing? Or how are they engaging in spiritual realities and habits so that we can not necessarily mimic what is happening, but enjoy just flow into that river of God's glory and, and see that. So that would be one, cultural humility. The number two would be um, uh, sh a a sharing ecology. How do we contextualize and adapt? How can we do ministry together in a way that we are open to what they bring the, 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 I call 
uh, the passion. Uh, I'm going to use two terms, la iglesia caliente y la iglesia fría, the hot church and the cold church. And many of the theologians and sociologists are familiar with those two terms. So how can we bring that? hot church, la iglesia caliente, into, into la iglesia fría, the, the cold church. And so the, the inherited church can embrace these new movements of the Holy Spirit and, and to listen and to seek to understand the, 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 this diverse and, and unique context that are coming in. So by listening first and seeking to understand those things, the, 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 the community around that, what, what is that going to look like? How the relational approaches we have to shift concerning ministry. For instance, you know, I am bilingual, bicultural. I'm a hybrid. I'm a U.S. I mean, I've been in the USA since 1984. I'm a U.S. person, but I'm also very Latino. Hablo los, los dos idiomas. So, but, in, but then when I'm thinking about ministry globally and how this the, the global south can uh, can create a new a new dynamics into the the global north would be things like the use of time what what is the meaning of time um, how do we measure time what is more important is more important the relationship or the time and how can these two be balanced so we can solve certain tensions. But those two examples are, are, are the most basic one that I can bring to, to our attention today in our conversation. Yeah, there's a lot there. I feel like there's a course underneath what you just said <laughs> uh, about how we can learn together. And, and that's kind of exciting to me to think about what would it be to have new conversations. That leads me to where you ended the sense of how do we... How would you give church planters in our context here in the U.S. some um, encouragement or ideas on how do we actually discern where God is leading? I think one of the, the pieces I heard you both explicitly and implicitly say is there's a leading of the spirit in the church of the South to be, to be a hot church, to be passionate, to be adaptable to the questions of the people and the context that's changing, there's a leading of the spirit. And what would it mean for church planters in the U.S. to be leaning into that a little bit more? One thing I could mention is we need to learn to be the church in different cultural contexts. One, one thing would not fit everybody else. And, and so if we can be able to learn or exegete or to study the context so that way we don't have to necessarily impose what has been, what has been happening over here. In other words, the success of one place not necessarily may work in another location. So we need to learn to, 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 to see that. What, what is the context there? For a church planter to be effective in that setting is to understand what, what, what do people do there? How do they live together? What is community like? Uh, what are the main issues that they're facing? Um, what are people doing community? Where, where, how do they enjoy life? What are specific things that they do together? So that, in a sense, we, we need to, to see that and then be flexible enough to learn that in God and through God, he can help us to do that, what I call the research, the studies, the mission insight kind of things, the information. But mainly what I have found the most fruitful is whenever I call the boots on the ground, when I go and sit with people and eat with them. And, and at that moment, they inform me in ways that I never thought or I was not able to see. So whenever I go to one place, the one question I ask, help me to see what I don't see in this specific city, community, or or, city, or, or street, or, or avenue where we are. So one way to think about culture is also generationally. And I'm curious what your thoughts are as we think about church being contextualized for younger generations. It seems that it, particularly in uh, mainline denominations in the U.S., there's a... Um, 
you know, way in which they're dominated by, in many places, by older generations and younger people don't feel like necessarily the way of doing church is speaking their language. So, um, so share with us a bit about that uh, younger generations. Sure. Um, thank you for, for that detail. That's a very, very unique uh, uh, idea. Um, by the way, we, my, my whole family, we, we're attending a church where intergenerational ministry happens supernaturally. Here's, here's the deal. And what I have seen and I have observed, many of the kids and the youth who come, they know that because they, they move, I'm talking about Lexington, Kentucky, where we have a university, many colleges, and places where, where a lot of younger generations come from other states. So, so here's one thing. They don't have a grandfather or they don't have a family. Okay, so, and then the older generation of the persons, the church members who are there, perhaps because of the fact that the kids have, have gone away, have traveled, have gone to work somewhere else, they don't have the, their children or their grandchildren. So they are adopting these kids who are coming, seeking for the elders <laughs> to connect in that way. And, and, and honestly, I, I've been asking questions left and right about this congregation and and it happens supernaturally uh, so we ha- so you have groups of younger uh, generations even children praying for grandparents and it's, it is just so beautiful and, and or grandparents or or the older generation praying for them um, I think that in a sense we we the family of God, is composed of that. God is a God of intergenerational. In other words, for instance, uh, Eli, he knew the voice of God. He could distinguish how he spoke. He understood his language and his narrative. But Eli needed Samuel to hear the voice because for some reason or another in that narrative, Eli has lost some of the antenna in communications with God. But God speaks to a new generation, Samuel. But he has to run to Samuel and to say, help me to hear what I hear. Are you the one calling me? And that happens three times. But the third time, Eli now knows that God is speaking through Samuel, and he's okay with that, and so is Samuel. So I think that when, when I embrace that narrative, I, 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 love, I love to see that happening. For instance, to be more personal for the listeners, um, my, my youngest child asked me on Sunday, Daddy, what would have happened to me if I had not have been born in this family? And, and that was a deep, profound question. It really shook. Listen, it shook, it shook the foundations of my life. I didn't know what to answer. And, and I said, you know what? Um, let, me, let me think about that. Um, because immediately I would have said, well, God was going to take care of you, etc. So we began, and, and throughout the entire day on Sunday, we went to play basketball one-on-one. We talked about it. And, and so he was teaching me what faith is all about at that age by engaging me in deeper questions. So my point is, we need all generations coming together, worshiping God. And I'm not saying that maybe churches don't have to have programs for specific needs or specific groups. No, it's not either or. It is both and. So at times, my child runs to his children's church, but at times he says, Daddy, I think I need to hear what pastor... Uh, what the pastor is going to be preaching about. I love these themes, and, and he's there. And here's the, another component I've, I've learned from younger generations. They, my kids in particular, they may be there with you and I. We're going to be talking about so many other things, and, but they're listening. So in a, and that's what the gospel is about. It's all about, about listening, interpreting. What does that mean for me? What does that look like? I love that story and that answer. 
Um, I'm a new grandma. Dwight knows this. Uh, number two grandchild was just born uh, two weeks ago. Oh, beautiful. I know. Yes. And on Sunday, my uh, I pastor at a different church than where my husband and children go. So at sun- on Sunday, they went to the church that my kids grew up at. And it was, you know, baby is eight days old. And the stories that came were just touching. First of all, some of these older grandma types, right, that aren't related to them, but have known Elizabeth, she was little, could hardly wait to meet this little one, Mm. right, who have journeyed with her and to have these conversations, as well as, um, I think, that congregation over the years, since that daughter was like first or second grade, they've given her a place to share her voice. In first grade, she wanted to do something for Feed My Starving Children, which was raising money for people that didn't have food. And they gave her a space to do that. I think what you're tapping into is when communities in, that are intergenerational open space for the younger voices, right? Like you said, take their questions or impulses seriously but also just value their relational um, kind of dialogue, right? And the uh, coming by, coming alongside each other at those milestone moments of life, right? That big questions like what would happen if I wasn't born into this family, right? Because where else in our culture, I'll say this, for my children other than church, there aren't any other intergenerational. That doesn't mean every church is a good place for that. But what I'm saying is outside of church communities, there are no other as as expansive intergenerational communities as faith communities. Right, right. It, yes. And and so when I read the, the, the narrative in the scripture, in the Old Testament and New Testament, you have you have the whole house in the New Testament. For instance, Paul is preaching and the whole house is being baptized. Uh, all the, uh, I mean, the parents, or maybe grandparents, the, the whole house with the children. And so how exciting it is to see parents baptizing the children in, in, in the context of the inherited church. It is just beautiful. It is just beautiful. So last question. What gives you hope about the future of the church? Oh, I think that all of what I'm seeing gives me hope for, for, for the future. But here's, here's one, a couple of things. Um, Number one, resilience. Um, I think I've seen uh, as I coach different leaders in denominations and in congregations, I see a resilience. I, I see this this uh, spirit that is so strong that the, the roots are going really deep. The second thing that I that I'm that I'm that I see I see across is adaptability. Um, I think that COVID taught us a great lesson. Number one, we cannot live on isolation. It's impossible. So I think that the hope for the church is that resilience that I see, the adaptability to changes that are happening as we speak today. And throughout history, the church has faced many challenges and it found ways to renew itself and remain a beacon of hope. So. In a hopeless world, whatever little hope that you have is a huge ocean of possibilities. Because once the people who may feel so hopeless find it, they would drink water from that hydrant of God's divine love. So uh, I see a growing willingness within the church to engage with the world in meaningful ways in new creative ways. Um, I see the church as uh, the other hope that I see, that they're embracing uh, change as an opportunity to grow. Rather than something to be feared, they're saying, okay, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to, to go to the volcano. I, I wanna see w- what life is is like. So uh, the, uh, the other thing that I have observed is this energy within um, certain generations of justice and mercy 
um, I've uh, I've noticed the the deepening in, in commitments to be cross cultural, um, the, the the desire to be intergenerational, to 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 move together, to to do life in a new vibrant ways. So I'm I'm very encouraged for the ways that the church is learning to listen, to adapt, and to respond to the Holy Spirit leading, even in uncertain times that we are in now. Well, Dr. Mejia, thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom with us today. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the Pivot Podcast. To spread the word about Pivot, if you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or some other platform, uh, please leave us a review. That really helps us uh, engage with you and, and hear what is meaningful for you. Finally, the best compliment you can give us is to share Pivot with a friend. Until next time, this is Dwight Shiley and Terry Elton signing off. See you next week.